What can the late 1970s tell us about today's economic situation? We're going to ask Jeff Snyder, our resident monetary historian, time traveler, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. Jeff, you started out a recent essay at Real Clear Markets, which was posted today, April 16th. The title is History Isn't on Your Side If You're Looking for Inflation. And you started out by bringing us to November 1978. Now, I took a little bit of time to find out what happened that particular month, just to set the scene for our audience. And it is all positively depressing. It was a bad time, Jeff. That particular month, some very memorable things happened. I'm not going to bring them up because that's no way to start out the show. Let's then just go straight into your article and your story. What was happening in November 1978 in the United States, President Carter, the economy, the monetary situation? It's kind of odd because it's exactly the opposite of the title of the, of the essay, which is that history isn't on your side today with regard to the inflation case. But in November 1978, as most people probably know, it absolutely was on their side. In fact, it was so much on their side that government authorities, even just regular person on the piece, just wanted it to, or regular person on the street, just wanted it to stop. You know, there was so much inflation. Nobody knew really where it was coming from, how it was manifesting, how it was getting worse year after year after year after year. And of course, President Carter, who was elected in 76, came into office largely pledging to be the guy who finally solved the big problem. And I know looking back, you know, as I said in the article, looking back from our, our post-Cold War perch, we think that, you know, during that time period, our biggest concerns were the Soviet Union, the spread of communism, nuclear war, all of those kinds of things. But in the 1970s, especially the late 1970s, you know, people really were not focused on those things. They were focused on their kitchen table, which was the price of everything, everything going up by double digits, you know, year after year. At the same time, the unemployment was rising, which was supposed to be an impossibility, certainly the impossibility that the uh, economists had said from derived from A.W. Phillips's work in the Phillips curve, the idea that inflation and an unemployment could be both rising together. Suddenly you had this worst case, seemingly nightmare scenario in the late seventies where you had lots of unemployed workers where the prices of everything went up year after year after year. And here was president Carter saying, I'm going to stop. It. I'm going to end it. I'm going to do this. And he explained being in tune, being a politician and he was, aware of this concern and he explained that he was going to look for a way to arrest the currency's devaluation, loss of value, devaluation, too strong a word, but it was losing value relative to other currencies, relative to gold, famously. And so he convened a commission, a group to come up with a plan of how to stop that. But you say, because, the, because President Carter said that this was an undeserved depreciation. But in your article, you say the dollar's downward dive was unreservedly deserved as the necessary consequence of prolonged official incompetence. I think most people would say, okay, it's deserved because interest rate differentials. They wouldn't say, well, it's the officials that have been messing it up. And I guess I mentioned it earlier, gold. Is this somehow related to Nixon going off the gold standard? Is that the official incompetence you're referencing? No, but that's the official story. The official story is that President Nixon closed the gold window in August of 1971, which he did. Absolutely. That absolutely did happen. But that didn't mean nearly as much as we're, we're told to believe today. And it certainly didn't mean much back then. You have to understand back at that period, we had just been under, or we had been under, you know, the world had been under a fixed exchange rate system for a very, very long time. That's most, that's all most people knew. And the idea was, okay, if we let currencies float, we let their prices fluctuate based on market conditions, that will alleviate some of these foreign monetary pressures that we can't really explain. That Robert Triffin said a decade before was, you know, the, the incompatibility of national currency with the global reserve system, Triffin's paradox. So the idea was that we'll let dollar, we'll let currencies float, including the dollar. The exchange value will be determined by the market, and that will alleviate these pressures. And of course, we, we fast forward to 1978, 
what President Carter was saying is not only do we have inflation, not only do we have high employment, now the U.S. dollar is diving. And I think you know, devaluation is not a too strong a word, Emil. I think it was absolutely appropriate because the dollar was losing value against most currencies very rapidly, as it was another kick in the teeth, another sign to Americans that this our system is going completely haywire and nobody has any answers for it. So you can understand both Carter's urgency as well as why he was in the dark about it because the official story, you know, economists that had kept coming forward throughout the 1970s with one plan after another, none of them working. He was just basically kind of trying to throw things, uh, throw things at the wall and see what, see what would possibly work. And most of what it came down to was actually contained in his infamous crisis of confidence speech that came six months later, which he basically blamed America. Said, hey, this is all your fault. You need to be more confident in the way things are. And that's what really our problem is. I mean, the crisis of confidence speech is one of the top worst speeches any president has ever given. And this is you know, another reason why, because it wasn't our fault. It wasn't America's fault. It was the fact that these people had no idea what they were doing. And the idea was, well, if we show that we're going to arrest the dollar's decline, that will be the thing that stops inflation. And so we'll issue these Carter bonds or what came to be called Carter bonds, and that will help stop the dollar's decline and that will they'll get inflation under control and we'll get the, the economy back in order. Now, the Carter bonds is immediately ahead of this character that I want to introduce into our play here. And the, the character is Robert Rusa, who gave a very interesting quote that about a decade later, that spoke to the unintended consequences of letting the currencies float. I'm going to read it out. Quote, under the fixed rate capital flows, wait, this is hard to see here. Under the fixed rate system, capital flows were expected to play a subsidiary role, tending to reinforce an already impending exchange rate adjustment brought about by comparative price changes and shifts in trade. But under conditions of floating, capital flows have more and more become the prime determinants of exchange rates, thereby imposing on the current account the burden not only of adjusting for changes in relative prices or trading potentials, but also of overcompensating for excesses induced by capital flows. Very wordy, but it's a key critical point that I think ties back to present day, not too long ago when President Trump was implementing his trade war tariffs, quote unquote. And he was trying to fix the balance of payments by it affecting the trade account, the current account. But here, decades ago, Robert Rusa, and then M Michael Pettis brings this up every time, it's the capital account that drives it all. Yeah, it's, it's the global monetary system. That was Rusa's segue into that. And really that's what Carter bonds were intended to be too. Let's be, you know, go, go back and, and you know, explain what those were. Carter intended to issue in November 1970, well not, you know, November 1978 into 1979, $10 billion of US treasury debt obligations, but they were not normal US treasury debt obligations. They were borrowing in, in, in German marks and Swiss francs and it wasn't because they're trying to finance the deficit. It was because they needed to borrow these foreign currencies because the Federal Reserve and the Exchange Stabilization Fund had run out of ammunition <laughs> trying to intervene in currency markets throughout the 70s, particularly in 1978 up to that point. The Federal Reserve had maxed out essentially its swap line. I think the uh, uh, Anna Schwartz had said it was something like five and a half billion dollars, which in 1978 was a massive amount for the Fed to be um, a Fed liability to other central banks in terms of currency swaps. So the Carter bonds were on one hand sort of a shock and awe show of force to the regular person saying, look, the government's doing something huge, 10 billion in foreign currencies. We're going to build up a massive war chest to defend the dollar. How could it possibly go wrong? When on, behind the scenes, underneath all the while, the government in different pockets, you know, the Federal Reserve, the Exchange Stabilization Fund had been trying to defend the dollar to big, to big, huge amounts to no effect. And really they needed the Treasury Department to essentially bail them out of their, what were really synthetically short dollar positions as the dollar was crashing. So it was, you know, incompetence that tried to be a confidence instilling in the public because obviously the problem is the public blame America for this. I mean, it's just, 
it's so patently absurd. It's no, it's no wonder why it didn't work. It's very, well, first of all, it's embarrassing to hear that your country has to borrow in another currency uh, bonds, just like right now emerging markets have to because people don't trust that currency, the Argentinian peso. So it's a little bit embarrassing that it led to this point that they had to borrow those francs and marks. Uh, but it was because in the 60s and 70s, not maybe not even the 60s, in the 70s, they were trying to rescue the dollar's devaluation. And so they were in the currency markets and they had- Yeah, the remember what the, the theory was, we'll let currencies float. The next, we will not return, we will no longer return, redeem paper U.S. dollars in gold, foreign requests. Remember, the U.S. went off the gold standard in the 30s, but the, under Bretton Woods, foreigners could redeem, foreign official accounts could redeem dollars for gold. So we're not going to let them do that anymore. We're going to allow the, we're going to allow the U.S. dollar exchange value to float. And the idea was that the market would find an equilibrium. We would find some way that the, that this would stop the the uh, foreign foreign monetary imbalances from tri contributing to the great inflation. And that just it was it was it was wrong. It was, it was flat out wrong. And what so was... we paid for it for the rest of the 1970s through rising inflation, rising unemployment, as well as now dollar devaluation that no one had anticipated because they didn't realize what was really happening is that the world had been flooded with dollars, not through the current account or merchandise trade, but through the euro dollar system. And so the euro dollar had been leaking back into the United States as a flood of dollars. It had been creating all sorts of imbalances all over the world. And you have all of these economists and central bankers and politicians flying blind, not realizing what they were doing were only making it worse. They were only contributing to imbalances by increasing frictions, by imposing externalities, arbitrary externalities that simply just made the whole situation that much worse. Jeff, can you coach me up and remind me what was the exchange stabilization fund? The Exchange Stabilization Fund is a separate entity, uh, ostensibly uh, well, used to be at that time part of the U.S. Treasury. Now it's the, most of its powers have been given over in the Monetary Control Act of 1980 to the Federal Reserve. But prior to that, it had been brought about in the 1930s as one way to combat the British who had gone off the gold standard at the early part of the Great Depression and were manipulating the British pound and the U.S. Treasury Department wanted to have some way of uh, of operating in foreign currency markets to attend to or to attempt to intervene in U.S. dollar exchange value, which was fixed at that time, should it ever should it ever uh, happen or need to. So the exchange stabilization fund had been around for many years, and it had started been to it had started to be used more often in the early 1960s and leading up to more and more into the 1970s. Let's talk about the 1960s and let's bring in Robert Triffin. You say in your article that monetary officials were already struggling in the 1960s to combat this external force of dollars, how to reconcile it. And you bring up his very famous, and then you say, though incomplete paradox. Tell us why Triffin's dilemma, as it was presented, why was it incomplete? Well, what Triffin never, well, actually he did realize later later on, in fact, I think he was at the same conference that we just referenced with Robert mm -hmm. Russo in 1984, talking about the same thing that Robert Russo was, which was euro dollar. Mm -hmm. In the early, late 50s, early 1960s, nobody realized that, you know, a national currency could sort of shed its skin and become an international currency while still being associated with a national currency. That's really what the euro dollar was. The euro dollar was, technically a national currency but it had become at least the the uh, the roles and the functions of a global reserve currency were filled by an extra national currency which was technically us dollar denominated but it was really bank centered liabilities and assets and all sorts of resources which were contributing to this new sort of way of doing things so triffin's paradox is incomplete in that he was strictly speaking about the US dollar being a national currency it was a very poor, in fact, incompatible with uh, a global reserve currency dominated by gold and fixed exchange. So he was right about that. And then he came to realize later, as Robert Russo did, that, oh, well, the US dollar actually became something else we never anticipated. It, it, it transformed itself into this global currency system that is just, that, that went too far. <laughs> it went crazy for a while there.
I don't think you, you told us the Triffin Paradox uh, 101, though. Just tell us what is the paradox, and then we'll understand why, why it didn't actually account for the offshore international dollar. Right. So it's a reserve currency, which means that dollars need to be available all over the world because countries intermediate through dollars. For example, as we talked about before, if you're, you know, bank in, uh, a company in Singapore needs to um, needs to go onto the world market and buy some resources to import into Singapore, you need dollars to do that. You can't use Singapore dollars. You have to use U.S. dollars. So U.S. dollars have to be available in Singapore, in Brazil, and Africa, and Asia, and China, and everywhere else around the world. Except in order for US dollars to be available, there has to be enough of those dollars, which means they have to be created and, and forward into the global system. But it's, since it's a national currency, at least it was envisioned to be a national currency, the US dollar, and the US dollar was exchangeable for gold reserves, too many dollars for that national system would mean too many dollars would be converted into gold. And pretty soon the US would lose all of its gold reserves. There would be no gold backing left for all of these paper dollars floating around the rest of the world. That was Triffin's paradox. So the idea is that you can't have a sound gold-backed dollar and have it also be contributing to monetary flows that allow globalization and increasing global trade. And it was absolutely true. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, that's exactly what happened. All of these dollars started to flow back and blow back onto the American system. And they were, they were converted mostly by the French into U.S. gold and the gold, U.S. system, the U.S. Uh, reserves dwindled or got drained considerably in the late 50s and early 1960s, such that it caused a problem. The difference was even in the late 50s, these were not paper dollars that were necessarily being redeemed, but redeemed, but dollar deposits and dollar balances, ledgers, and all sorts of the, the virtual currency, reserveless currency we talk about under the euro dollar system. So the Carter bonds, late 1970s, to try to save the Federal Reserve from ex overextending itself in the currency markets. But before, and that was, and why did they overextend themselves? They were trying to combat the Euro dollar system. Earlier though, in the 60s, there was an, an attempt by Robert Russo, or not by him, at least bonds were named after him or certificates. Let me read a quote here from Robert Russo, October, 1963, Foreign Affairs. Quote, a crisis affecting at least one major currency has threatened each year. This is 1963. It's going to get worse. We know that. That's, it's incredible how bad it was already then. The U.S. balance of payments has been in continuous large deficit, and the stability of the convertible gold, dollar, and sterling system has been increasingly questioned. That eventually led to... Yeah, and I want, certificates? There's, there's an important point about that too. When Russo was speaking in 62 and 63, what he was saying is that the current account deficit was a large contributor to these, you know, the, the currency problems around the world. But if you actually go into the statistics and read some of the transcripts, as I have sadly done far too many times, what they tell you is that it was just not merchandise. It wasn't that we're importing more than we're exporting. At that time, it was called short-term capital flows. And it wasn't really short-term capital flows. It was bank deposit balances shifting back and forth with the euro dollar mark. Even in those early years, the euro dollar was having an effect and they didn't know how to interpret this, the, the accounting. They thought this was bank shifting dollars overseas when it, that wasn't really the case. It was the euro dollar system affecting U.S. banking situation, U.S. bank balance sheets such that it created current account deficits. And that was their way of being notified that this global monetary system, this global dollar system was expanding so much that it was causing irregularities in the, in the uh, regular accounting, the traditional accounting. So here we are in the early 1960s. And as Roos has said, one currency crisis after another each of these years. And what do we do about it? Because, you know, Bretton Woods, fixed exchange, this stuff is all supposed to be worked out. By the way, the U.S. has lost, I think it was almost more than half of its gold reserves in the late 50s. So there were some serious, serious problems way, way, way before August of 1971 and Richard Nixon. The Rusa bonds, what do we need to know about them? Well, as all of these, you know, um, these currency crises that Rusa was talking about arose in the early 60s, they all had one thing in common, the U.S. dollar. 
because the US dollar was the global reserve and it was the intermediating currency, intermediating currency. And as I said, you know, I brought up an example in the article and you can read more detail about it, uh, a specific example with Canada. I mean, banks in Europe were invested in Canada. They soured on Canada, Canada for several reasons. And so they started to withdraw money from Canada and the, the way they did so, they didn't convert from Canadian dollars into German marks or Swiss francs, they intermediated through the US dollar. So that brought the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury into what was a, supposed to be a Canadian European affair because by very nature of the global reserve currency. And what the Federal Reserve decided to do in those, in that, those early years of the 60s is they got involved with the BIS and all sorts of other central banks like the Swiss National Bank and Bundesbank and decided to swap a bunch of currency, uh, currency debt. So the swap stuff that we talked about in the late 70s actually started out in the early 60s. In the early 60s, they were attempting essentially to create the illusion of stability and control in the Bretton Woods version of the dollar so as to maintain the Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods version of the dollar as long as they could while not being forced to convert more gold from these dollars, overseas dollars. So it was a way of trying to manage these imbalances with their fingers crossed, just hoping they would go away. And what Robert Russo said was, look, this stuff is just getting worse. What we need to do is, all right, the Fed has reached, it's getting close to its maximum. It can't, it, it, it doesn't have the statutory authority to roll over swaps into the long run. It has some authority and it's, you know, it was kind of questionable authority at that time, whether they can intervene in foreign currency markets like they were, especially so, um, so, uh, um, you know, sort of disingenuous as it was trying to hide all of this negative dollar stuff. Uh, so what Robert Russo says, the treasury needs to get involved, we'll issue these debt certificates that will essentially bail out the Fed swap lines. So essentially it was exactly like the Carter bond scheme in the late seventies that it was for, first developed in the early 1960s to essentially take the, 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 the burden of currency swap debt off of the central bank, which can't have it, it's off the burden of the exchange stabilization fund, which is hor horribly mismanaged, and have the Treasury Department essentially term out those liabilities so that currency interventions don't necessarily add to the imbalances that are already plaguing all of these currencies. The 1960s currency swap echoes a little bit the corporate bond purchases of last year and the questions as to whether or not the Federal Reserve has the authority to be involved at all. And, but if you contort yourself and you squint your eyes at the legal legalese, yeah, yeah, you can make it work. 13.3 is very broad. It's, it's the Federal Reserve Act. It has become very broad. And it's really, hey, if we say something's an emergency, we can do whatever we need to do. And really nobody's ever called the Fed on it because the Fed's independent um, and nobody will ever say, but you know, maybe, did that actually work? Did you actually need to do that? Nobody, that's never, that kind of accountability has never been imposed. And this is not something that just, you know, as you pointed out, this is not just something for, you know, to consider for 2020 or 2021. We're talking about the 1960s here. This is 60 some odd years ago, 60 years ago, six decades of all of this stuff. Now we're going to link it back to present day, all of these stories. Just after I read this quote from the 40th anniversary of Bretton Woods, there was a conference. And Jeff, if we had a hall of fame of quotes, this quote from Robert Rusa would be in the hall of fame. It's a little bit long, but I'm going to read it because it's so important. Here we go. One improvisation after another was attempted in order to preserve or restore confidence in the credibility of the dollar as a reliable standard of value and medium of exchange capable of assuring stability in the payment relations throughout an expanding world. But this combination of improvisations could not cope with and indeed may have contributed to the enormous expansion in markets for US dollars offshore and the new networks of interbank relations that made possible the creation of additional supplies of dollars outside of the United States and beyond the control of the Federal Reserve. Mic drop, if central bankers and, and uh, monetary officials did have microphones, he would just drop and walk off the stage, that's it. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, I what's really important about, there's lots of things that are important about that. That's why it's such an important quote. But in the context of what we're talking about now, 
what he's basically saying is that's how you explain 20 years of this stuff never being solved. From the early 1960s, it got worse, it got worse, progressively worse, progressively worse. Not only did the currency problem get progressively worse, the economic problems got progressively worse because of it, because you couldn't solve the monetary problems. The U.S. economy, not just the U.S. economy, the entire global economy suffered under almost two decades of this great inflation, which was a horrible period in time. It's really, I think to most people nowadays, they don't, they don't realize because we've been taught that the central bank is this, 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 this ideal technocratic you know, model that we should all hope, you know, run our own lives based on the, their example, because they're the most, you know, they're, they're, they're the positive best exemplar of how to do these kinds of things when that's really never been the case the federal reserve's entire history has been one failure one huge failure after another what happened in the 1960s and 70s actually typifies how the federal reserve has been run since its very beginning you know the 1920s not ex i mean yeah it was, it was the roaring 20s but it set us up for the 1930s which the federal reserve never saw coming didn't positively impact contributed to it but continuing to be worse so over the fed's entire history it has been right quote unquote only by accident on a few occasions and for much of its history as robert russo was saying and not just robert russo all the robert triffin too for much of the Fed's history, it has been a bungling agency, more like the Keystone Cops than anything like what we're taught today with, you know, Alan Greenspan's put and all of the rest of the myth and lore about a competent Fed, don't fight the Fed and all this other crap. Jeff, I'd like you to take us out and explain the key takeaways of this essay now. But before you do, you know, another reason why I think that quote is very important, because it seems to me that conference was the last outpost of monetary scholarship where the euro dollar was of interest. After this conference, at least that I'm aware of, it seems like it, it became a desert. Before, before the conference, people were asking, what do we do with this euro dollar system? It's important, it's big, what are we gonna do? After this, silence. And we don't hear anything again for like a decade until Greenspan says, in his 96 speech, if I remember correctly, that, uh, you know, irrational exuberance, but that it's a, the, the end of scholarship. That's, that's my, yeah, it, was, it was the beginning of the, uh, the Paul Volcker myth that the fed actually, you know, Paul Volcker supposedly solved the great inflation. And that's, that's another topic we can get into some other day that a, a determined central bank is the answer to all of our problems. And it was Volcker and then Greenspan that cultivated that myth through the quote unquote great moderation, which wasn't all that moderate to begin with, which was nothing more than the euro dollar system maturing and spreading out to the rest of the world and doing lots of good things, as well as lots of bad things, which the good things central banks took credit for and the bad things they said didn't happen. And that really cultivated this myth of the competent modern central bank run on expectations rather than actual money. And that's the one that most people are picturing. But what we actually see throughout its history, and again, the great inflation is a perfect example, and it's also a, a very relevant example to the last you know, 14, 15 years of our own experience because it's in some ways exactly the same thing, just flipped in the other direction. If the euro dollar's expansion in those early days contributed to, and I think explained more of the great inflation than anything else so far, then the euro dollar's malfunction since 2007 explains the disinflation, the lack of inflation, the lack of economic growth, and the official, the official, especially central bank response to this last 15 years has been exactly the same as during the, the great inflation. They try one thing, it doesn't work, so they try to do more of that same thing. It doesn't work, so they try to do more of that same thing. In the same way, you can see the, the transition from a, a couple swaps leading to Rusa bonds in the early 1960s, eventually becoming massive swaps, exchange stabilization fund, and then Carter bonds in the late 70s, almost 20 years later, We've experienced exactly the same thing in our own recent times. We started out with a small QE that was focused on one thing that became a bigger QE focused on a couple of things. And now it's market support and QEs and buying of pretty much anything that's out there. And yet every time we're told, you know, Carter bonds are different from use Rusa bonds. Well, QE six is different from QE one. No, it's they keep doing the same things in each case because they don't know what they're doing. It's incompetence. And that's, that's really the default position of the central banks. And I would argue also econ economics. 
They don't take, as you were just pointing out, they don't take monetary scholarship seriously because monetary system, especially an open-ended supranational currency, doesn't fit into a DSG model in any way. It creates all sorts of infinities and singularities that break down the math. And so economists and central bankers have said, we'll just ignore these things and hope it don't bite us in the ass. One week ago on April 9th, the United States of America announced what the latest producer price index figures were, and they were at decade highs. In part two of this episode, we're going to ask Jeff Snyder if he retracts his belief in deflation, if these latest numbers have convinced him that he's wrong, and what sort of penitence he's going to pay for leading us astray. <laughs> Jeff, you're not too happy about that. <laughs> All right, let me... Yeah, let uh, me give you my frowny face. <laughs> <laughs> but first, this from Eurodollar Enterprises. Friends, are you worried your monetary policies are causing lurid levels of inequality? Are you concerned civil war, its hour come round at last, slouches toward K Street? Do you worry how your supple neck will fare when the blood-dimmed tide is loose? Then the new Eurodollar Enterprises second skin neck brace is for you. Yes, strut through the wasteland knowing that marauding lynch mobs of war boys pose no danger. The carbon fiber nano weave is comfortable, flexible, and the ultimate luxury in an April dystopia you hasn't. Barter aqua cola for guzzoline at Thunderdome with no concern. The guillotine, is that the road warrior with a chainsaw? Then save your skin with your second skin neck brace. New from Eurodollar Enterprises.